boys and girls, welcome to week number seven of Greek Myth Mania. And today we are exploring actually the last two members of the gods that make up the ruling gods and goddesses up in uh, Mount Olympus. And we are looking at Athena and Aphrodite. So let's take a look at those. We have my beat up copy of the Delari's Greek Myths book, as we have had in the past. And there is the link in the packet of papers to follow along if you want to follow along with the reading. Or you can just sit back, relax, and listen. Let's start with the first one that comes in the book, which is Aphrodite on page 30. And here we have the picture of her. Aphrodite, the beautiful goddess of love, was the only Olympian who had neither mother nor father. Nobody knew from where she had come. The west wind had first seen her in the pearly light of dawn as she rose out of the sea on a cushion of foam. She floated lightly over the gentle waves and was so lovely to behold that the wind almost lost his breath. With soft puffs, he blew her to the flowering island of Cythera, where the three graces welcomed her ashore. The three graces, goddesses of beauty, became her attendants. They dressed her in shimmering garments, bedecked her with sparkling jewels, and placed her in a golden chariot drawn by white doves. Then they led her to Olympus, where all the gods rejoiced in her beauty, seated her on a golden throne, and made her one of them. Zeus was afraid that the gods would fight over the hand of Aphrodite, meaning who would want to marry her, and to prevent it, he quickly chose a husband for her. He gave her to Hephaestus, the steadiest of the gods, and he, who could hardly believe in his good luck, used all of his skill to make the most lavish jewels for her. He made her a girdle of finely wrought gold and wove magic into the filigree work. That was not very wise of him, for when she wore her magic girdle, no one could resist her, and she was all too irresistible already. Aphrodite had a mischievous little son whose name was Eris. He darted about with a bow and a quiver full of arrows. They were arrows of love, and he delighted in shooting them into the hearts of unwary victims. Whoever was hit by one of his arrows fell head over heels in love with the first person he saw, while Eris laughed mockingly. Once a year, Aphrodite returned to Cythera and dived into the sea, from which she had come. Sparkling and young, she rose from the water, as dewy fresh as on the day when she had first been seen. She loved gaiety and glamour and was not at all pleased at being the wife of sooty, hard-working Hephaestus. She would rather have had his brother Ares for her husband. Now we know Ares was the god of war. Okay, let's turn to Athena on page 34. Athena, the goddess of wisdom, was the favorite child of Zeus. She had sprung fully grown out of her father's head. Her mother was Metis, goddess of prudence, the first wife of Zeus. He depended on her, for he needed her wise counsel. But Mother Earth warned him, that were Metis to bear him a son, this son would dethrone him, as Zeus had dethroned Cronus, his father, who had dethroned his own father, Uranus. This must not happen, thought Zeus, but he could not do without her advice, so he decided to swallow her. Slyly, he proposed that they play a game of changing shapes, and Metis, forgetting her prudence, playfully turned herself into all kinds of animals, big and small. Just as she had taken on the shape of a little fly, Zeus opened wide his mouth 
took a deep breath and zip, he swallowed the fly. Ever after, Meta sat in his head and guided him from there. Now it happened that Metis was going to have a daughter, and she sat inside Zeus's head, hammering out a helmet and weaving a splendid robe for the coming child. Soon Zeus began to suffer from pounding headaches and cried out in agony. All the gods came running to help him and skilled his festus, grasped his tools, and split open his father's skull. Out sprang Athena, wearing the robe and the helmet, her gray eyes flashing. Thunder roared, and the gods stood in awe. Now remember, that was okay to split open Zeus's skull, because he was immortal, and it didn't affect him. He was fine after. Athena's constant companion was Nike, the spirit of victory. With Nike at her side, Athena led armies, but only those that fought for just causes. In time of peace, she stood behind the artists of Greece and taught them the fine and useful arts. She had great pride in her own skills at the loom and the potter's wheel, but was happy to see her pupils excel as long as they showed her proper respect. One of her pupils was Arachne, a simple country girl who was wonderfully skilled at the loom. They're talking about weaving. People came from far and wide to admire her weavings. Stupidly, she boasted that she had learned nothing from Athena, indeed that she was better than the goddess. That hurt Athena's pride. Disguised as an old woman, she went to the girl and tried to talk sense into her. Your work is beautiful, she said, but why compare yourself with the gods? Why not be contented to be the best among mortals? Let the goddess Athena herself come and measure her skill against mine, Arachne answered haughtily. Angrily, Athena threw off her disguise and stood before the girl in all her glory. Vain girl, she said, you may have your wish. Sit down at your loom and let us compete. Athena wove the most beautiful tapestry ever seen. Every thread and knot was perfect and the colors sparkled. It pictured the Olympian gods in all their glory and majesty. Arachne's tapestry was also beautifully woven. Athena herself had to admit that the girl's craftsmanship was flawless. But what kind of picture had she woven? An irreverent scene making fun of Zeus and his wives. In a wrath, the goddess tore the tapestry to shreds and struck the girl with the shuttle. Immediately, Arachne felt her head shrink almost to nothing. Her nimble fingers change into long, spindly legs. Athena had turned her into a spider. Vain, glorious girl, go on and spin your thread and weave your empty net forever, said Athena to Arachne, the spider. Athena was a just goddess, and she could be very stern. She knew that the gods were great only as long as they were properly worshipped by mortals. Athena was very fond of a certain city in Greece, and so was her uncle, Poseidon. Both of them claimed the city, and after a long quarrel, they decided that the one who could give it the finest gift should have it. Leading a procession of citizens, the two gods mounted the Acropolis, the flat-topped rock that crowned the city. Poseidon struck the cliff with his trident, and a spring welled up. The people marveled, but the water was salty as the sea that Poseidon ruled, and not very useful. Then Athena gave the city her gift. She planted an olive tree in a crevice on the rock. It was the first olive tree the people had ever seen. Athena's gift was judged the better of the two, for it gave food, oil, and wood, and the city was hers. From her beautiful temple on top of the Acropolis, Athena watched over Athens, her city, with the wise owl, her bird, on her shoulder, and under her leadership the Athenians grew famous for their arts and crafts. 
So a couple things in that story. We do have the capital of Greece today is still called Athens after the goddess Athena. And over in Greece and some of the other countries nearby, they are famous around the world for their olive oil and the olives that come from that country. So this is one way the Greeks used to explain why olives were so prevalent, why they had so many of them, and did such wonderful things with them in their country. And arachne, as you may know, the technical scientific name for a spider is arachnid. And they say that comes from this story about how Athena turned proud arachne into the first spider. So, you didn't want to mess with the gods, huh? Okay, let's see what our other books say about her now. Either one of them. So, we started with Aphrodite. We'll go to her first. This is in the Weird But True National Geographic Kids book. Claim to fame for Aphrodite. She is the fairest goddess of them all. Why she's weird, Aphrodite used a swan-drawn cart to glide through the air. So it was swans that were pulling her along. Um, tells us about how she got her start. Aphrodite could have had her pick of husbands, but when it came to pinning her down, the fire god Hephaestus was the most persistent. It says in here, and we know in the other one, that Zeus paired her up. He trapped his mother, Hera, in a golden throne until she agreed to arrange a marriage between the two of them. Aphrodite wanted nothing to do with the not-so-handsome Hephaestus. Remember, he was handicapped, too. He had to have helpers get him around. But she couldn't argue with the queen, and so began another unhappily ever after mythological marriage. Hephaestus may have put a ring on her finger, but Aphrodite was less than loyal. She sought out love from the other gods, including Ares, the god of war, and Hermes, as well as with mortals. Hephaestus knew about these things and even tried to embarrass her for her dishonesty. But no one could stay angry at Aphrodite for too long. In the end, Hephaestus couldn't do much about her actions. She wound up having a son, Eris. Some say who's, that Ares, the god of war, was his father. Together, Aphrodite and Eris were in charge of making people and gods fall in love. And you have seen pictures of Eris very commonly around Valentine's Day, and that is who the Romans call Cupid. So all the time, all the Valentines and things you see with that chubby little cherub floating around with wings and pulling back his bow and arrow to shoot arrows of love into people. That's who the Greeks called Eris, and he was Aphrodite's son. It's mythic. The Greek word for foam, as in the foam of the sea, is Aphros, a likely nod to Aphrodite, who what we know rose up out of the sea. Some ancient Greeks were said to fall in love with statues of Aphrodite. Aphrodite was all about love, but she also had a hand in starting the Trojan War, which we will get into another week. Aphrodite inspired love around her, and for some she sparked creativity, too. In fact, the Venus de Milo, one of the most famous sculptures in the world, which is this one here, and yes, it does not have any arms, well, is believed to represent the goddess of love. Venus is the Roman name for this goddess. Discovered in a pile of rubble among ruins on the Greek island of Milos, the six-foot, eight-inch tall marble statue is said to have been produced by an artist named Alexandros of Antioch around 100 years B.C., while the sculpture is stunning, it's not quite complete. It's famous for her missing her arms. Experts say that the limbs likely broke off over time, but that doesn't stop people from visiting Venus at her home in the Louvre Museum in Paris, France, every single day. The Venus de Milo. 
And then it has Eris in here too, God of Love. Why he's weird, Eris is shown as either a baby or as a young man. Armed with magical arrows, he could make anyone fall in love. I don't think it tells us too much else about modern myths calling him Cupid, just call him Babyface. In many works of ancient art, Eris is shown as a chubby infant with a set of wide white wings, carrying a quiver of arrows and a bow, just like in our Valentine's Day, huh? Arrow-minded, a dutiful sidekick, Eris pretty much did whatever Aphrodite asked, especially when she promised him a sweet reward for his task. One day, Aphrodite offered her son a golden ball that released a trail of flames once it was tossed to pierce the heart of Medea, the mortal daughter of a famous king. Aphrodite wanted Medea to fall in love with Greek hero Jason so she could use her powers as a sorceress to help him in taking the golden fleece, a coveted trophy and something we will read about in another myth. Okay, let's go back to Athena's page. Claim to fame, she was the namesake of Athens, Greece. She had the power to turn her enemies into icky things like spiders and snakes, which we know. We know how she came out of Zeus's brain. Oh, let's see, Athena had special powers and wasn't afraid to use them especially when it came to teaching someone a lesson, as we saw with Arachne. Take the tale of Medusa, for example, a beautiful young girl with a mega-sized ego. It means she thought really highly of herself. Medusa often bragged that she was the fairest maiden in all the land. Once Athena caught wind of her claims, she did what any wise goddess would do. She turned Medusa into a monster, of course. This one gave her long golden snakes on her hair. Well, not necessarily golden. Snakes on her hair instead of her beautiful golden locks of curls. The curse made Medusa so scary that the mere sight of her could turn anyone to stone. And we will encounter her in some of our future myths as well. Modern mythology Scientists in France recently borrowed from Greek mythology to name a newly discovered spider fossil that dates back some 305 million years. The fossil is one of the world's earliest known spiders and is named, okay, let's give this a try, Idmon, Idmon Arachne Bressieri, a reference to Idmon, the father of the skilled weaver Arachne. And we know about arachne itself is tied to re invertebrates that have four pairs of legs and no wings or antenna such as spiders scorpions mites and ticks they are all considered arachnids athena was famous for her majestic gray eyes she was the patroness of craftsmen and taught the greeks how to cook and so, so let's check out one last place about her in our National Geographic Treasury of Greek Myths book. And the first one we come to in here is Athena, goddess of wisdom. Very, very smart god to have on your side if you needed help. Uh, let's see. I don't think this is telling us anything we didn't know. And then we can go to Aphrodite. So I guess you have to kind of look at this way to make sense of, huh? Swirling around out of the water. Star like star bright. Venus is the ancient Roman's name for Aphrodite, we know. The planet Venus is the brightest object in the sky after the sun and the moon. Venus orbits the sun faster than Earth does. When it comes up behind Earth, it is visible after sunset. 
When it overtakes Earth, it is visible before sunrise. So it goes from being the evening star to being the morning star. The ancient Greeks were the first to recognize that these two stars were in fact one and the same object. There's a picture of Venus shining in the night sky. And that just says Aphrodite shown as goddess of love and beauty. By crafting a glorious belt, Hephaestus finally won his wife. And that's trying to show the picture of her and her glorious belt. So that is about it for the two of them in our books. If you look at your packets of coloring pages, you have from that first link we have posted on the website, Athena and Aphrodite. You can color and add to your collection which should be pretty much complete at this point. And then we have this packet of papers. Hopefully you print it out. Uh, the Ducksters website that gives you a little internet page of facts and things about the goddesses. And then at the end, the cool part is you can take a quiz. Nobody's grading you, so those are the fun kind and see how much you remember from what we read today plus what you read on their website. And if you can't read it all yourself, there's a button you can press and have it read out loud to you. So that's pretty cool, too. And there's another site for Athena and another one at the same location for Aphrodite. And now for the craft section, it says, let well, make some birds because both of these goddesses have birds as their symbol. So first up is make a swan, one of Aphrodite's symbols. And they said that her heart was pulled by swans in the sky. And this is the swan that I made based on the directions that you have in your packet. And it was super easy. So hopefully you are able to either draw your own or print out trying to pick up this template here, the template from the internet and cut that out because that was a big help and then get some feathers. They sell them at the dollar store. It doesn't have to be anything fancy and you trace out your handprint. You can see my handprints on the back there. I'm trying not to move this too much so all the glitter doesn't fall off because glitter is one of those things you know that you can never get rid of. So you cut out your hands, you glue them on the swan template and then you glue on your feathers. If you want to just leave it with your hands, you can do that. If you want to just leave it with the feathers glued on, you can do that. Or you can put glitter on top of your feathers. And I used gold and silver. But whatever colors you have or whatever color you want to make it is great. And then I had to cut off the quill part of the feather that's down at the tip. And when I did that, some of the feathers, kind of like glitter that goes everywhere, the feathers came loose everywhere. So I started trying to glue some of those feathery strands on as well. Maybe you want to do that to cover more of your swan with feathery particles. But that's how the swan came out. I thought that was pretty neat and that would kind of mimic the beauty of Aphrodite. And then Athena has directions in here to make some owl babies. You do not have to make them owl babies. If you want to make them big owls, you can do that. But I did mine like this. And I know the directions show you how to make three owl babies because that's based on a book about three owls that are babies. But I wanted to show you that you could do it with different color paint too. I have a brown owl in the middle. And you can't see him too well because he's on the black. But if you wanted to do brown owls, you could easily use blue paper and have it be nighttime and put the brown paint on there. Or you could just use white paper and put the brown paint on. Whatever you want to do. And I did do it the way they suggested because I thought that was really neat. You use a pom-pom dipped in the glue. And then you put that on and it gives it that fuzzy look. So after I did the brown, I also dipped it in the white and I put some white on top of the brown so that he wasn't a real dark color all over and some lighter feathers on him as well. This is just a lunch bag cut up. So if you don't have brown construction paper, 
you don't even have to have that. She suggests something else in her directions. And I forget what she said to do for the stars. Oh, she talked about glitter glue. If you don't have glitter glue, I just used the pom-pom dipped in white, but just very, very gently dipped it on to make stars and a little moon. And then these, the eye shapes and the beaks are just cut out of construction paper. So it was a really easy craft and I think it came out pretty cute. If you didn't want to do the three babies, you could do just one big one. You could make it the whole size of your paper. But the painting part was the fun part because you're dipping it in a pom-pom and you don't have to get your fingers dirty at all because you're holding it with a clothespin. So those were the two bird crafts because the owl is the symbol of Athena for her wisdom. Those baby owls will grow up to be very wise. Okay, then we had on our list, there's an online game you can go to about Athena. It asks you multiple choice questions and you have to tap the right answer. And I think the more you start getting right, the faster it goes. And there is a crossword puzzle you can do online about Aphrodite. Fill in the answers as you go. Different game. And if you have some brothers or sisters around, maybe you want to act out the Reader's Theater play about the birth of Athena. I'm trying to find my first sheet here. There we go. Tells you who you need, but you can always have one or two people be double parts if you need to because you don't have enough people. But it tells you about how she was born and about Metis flying into Zeus's mouth and all of that. So that is something you can actually act out. And lastly, there was some mad lives that you can write. One of them goes back to the very beginning when we were talking about Cronus and the start of the Greek gods, beginning of the world. And then this one is about, could be about all of the Olympian gods since we've read about them all now. And then this one was just about Athena. So you had three different ones you can print out and enjoy. So hopefully that gives you some other resources to explore these last of the Greek Olympian gods, Athena and Aphrodite. But we will continue doing Greek myth mania another week and beyond because there is so much more to Greek mythology than just those 14 gods and goddesses. There's tons of myth stories and famous heroes and creatures. Oh, the Greeks were so good at thinking of horrible creatures like the one we read about today just briefly. Medusa with snakes for hair. So keep watching and we will keep doing fun stuff together and learning more about Greek mythology. Thanks for watching today. This has been Miss Kathy and remember the library is open six days a week, just has different hours certain days. So check the schedule on our website so you can come in and check out some more Greek books on your own. Or if you don't feel comfortable doing that, you can always still call us and we will be happy to fill requests for you about Greek books or any book at all for that matter. And I will see you either in the library or back online soon. Bye.